Welcome back to Two Homers and a Realist. This is the midweek pod before Bedlam, the last Bedlam for some time. I'm not going to say forever because I think it's going to come back, but we'll see. Remains to be seen. I'm Steve. Lucas. Jay. Connor is not with us. Connor is, he's out scouting the opponent. He's recording their film and getting all their call signals down. Going to report back to us so that we know exactly what it means when they're going to hand the ball off to Ollie right, Ollie left, Ollie up the middle. That's pretty much their offense, and it's pretty much the biggest thing we need to be worried about, I think. But uh, maybe some other things. We'll talk about that. But before we get to that, let's give a shout-out to our sponsor, Fluke Luke. Fluke Luke Fishing. As you know, as we've talked about, um, that is the feel-good fishing channel for great fishing content, honest reviews of equipment and tackle. Go to his YouTube channel, like, watch, subscribe, do it all over again. Fluke Luke Fishing. Well, guys, we just lost a game to Kansas that we absolutely could have, should have, really should have won. Really shouldn't have been the contest that it was. Even though it was a tough contest, we were in it until the end. I would say that we did everything we could to steal, vic- steal defeat away from the jaws of victory. And I'm pretty fired up. I'm pretty mad and pretty worried that we can't get to where we want to be. Convince me that I'm wrong. I don't think I can convince you because I'm in the same boat. Um, going into the season, I th- I think I had us nine and three, if I remember right, and that's still very much on the table. Um, after the Texas game, which I had circled as one of our big chances of a loss, when we were at seven and zero, or I guess we were six and zero at that point, you know, we kind of came back and said, "Well, what would you say we are now?" And I came up with ten and two, I believe, because I still uh-huh. thought there was a couple losses out there, but one of the major hurdles was out of the way, and then Kansas was one that I had circled as a possible loss early in the or beginning of the season. That one comes to fruition, unfortunately, when we had every chance to win that game. If we stop them on fourth down on their final drive, we win. If we get a first down on the drive before, we win. If we don't throw a pick six, we probably win. It's just one calamity after another. Um, after looking over the stats again, one of the glaring ones to me is um, we were 2 of 10 on third down. That's so bad against – a team that's decent on defense, but not great. And you can throw all the weather stuff out there and say, yeah, it was cold and rainy and crappy, but there's no excuse when we rush for 269 yards and you're two of 10 on third down. Those, those two stats don't compute to me. Yeah, it was just so disappointing overall from every aspect. I think it's been harped on enough throughout all the fans and media and everywhere else. Uh, Really just a total team let down, to be honest. Offensively inept, play calling, scheme, play design, uh, personnel choice, uh, too conservative. Um, I don't know, all of it. So I think that's the question is, do we rebound? Can we rebound? I think we absolutely can rebound. Uh, Not to harp on it too much, but all of us on this pod, pretty early on, even up into... But prior to this season, questions Levy's ability as an offensive coordinator. And Oklahoma is not a learn-on-the-job situation. And unfortunately, Mm -hmm. I do think he is learning on the job. He can improve. I think the team is still capable of improving. And without getting on DG too much, uh, he he is what he is. He's better than what he got to show at Kansas. He's definitely better than that. He's not as good as everyone thought he was. Correct. And what really frustrates me is, is if he is truly a Heisman candidate, why can't he not throw the ball down the field? If he's truly a great quarterback, why can't he not throw the ball down the field? I thought it was laughable that, honestly, that he was up for the Heisman after, like, the Texas game. I mean, it was a a great victory, last-minute drive, come down the field, but... You can't watch him play and honestly tell me that he was anywhere near being the third best player in the country. No. Come no. Heisman odds. I mean, it's just. No, I don't think so either. You know, we surveyed our Twitter base. What went wrong on offense against Kansas? Play calling, quarterback play, both, but more play calls, 
both but more quarterback play. 59% play calling. 38% both but more play calls. 3% both but more quarterback play. I wonder if that was a misclick or two. Um, I, I, I think you have to really put most of the blame on Lebby, and you can spin that a couple different ways, and, and I, I swear we're going to talk about the upcoming game, but all of this is relevant for it. Your play calling dictates how your quarterback is going to play. And if you don't put him in a position to win, then you're in a really good position to leave points on the on the table, on the field, and not do what you have to do, especially on the road, to uh, put yourself in a position to win and actually win a ball game. And I think that's what happened. He put his quarterback in a very difficult bind in a number of different ways, and his quarterback isn't good enough to get him out of it. Baker Mayfield would have been, among others. He's not good enough. Caleb Williams can get you out of a lot of binds. You can play. You can call bad calls for for Caleb, and he will get you out of those positions. Dylan is not good enough to do that. Um, so that worries us, and it's the focus, I think, because we know going into Bedlam, if we don't put points on the board, we're going to be in trouble. We have a good defense. I think our defense is actually better than what people have been giving it credit for most recently. I think they actually played a really good game at Kansas, all things considered. But they can't win the ball game by itself. This is not going to be a 1985 ice bowl. This is going to be a good weather game where the opposing team has a good offense, especially a great running back, and they're going to have a great chance to put a lot, both put points on the board and absorb a lot of um, time of possession. My main concern going into this game is are they going to be overly aggressive down the field because of how much heat that they've caught, right? Are they going to overcorrect? I, I had the same thought and the same worry. I could see them almost like they're sticking it to us, say, you want to see us throw the ball down the field? Here's three and out. Right. Boom. Here's another three and out. See why we do what we do? Now watch the jet sweep and love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, hope, I hope it's not that. I, they just need to, you know, it seems so simple, but if you're running the ball and it's working, do it. Mix in shots down the field and just roll with it. Just don't overthink it. I miss the old days of play action out of the pistol. It seems like something we haven't done in a long time and that if you brought it back could be effective because Kansas was stacking nine and even on that final drive or the the – next to last drive where we were trying to get the first down to win the game, 10 guys in the box at some point. And to me, the, the running back being to the side, yeah, you can fake the draw and all that kind of junk, but actually getting your running back a little bit of a head of steam, if you're not going to run it out, of the, out from underneath center, that the pistol allows a little bit more, not necessarily misdirection, but it's to me it's easier to fake that handoff from – the running back coming from that direction than just standing to your side. And that opens up play action for the deep ball when they are stacking the box. Yeah, I think that's important because what I worry about is if Levy is simply scripting or calling blindly everything he calls. We had nine people in the box against us, and we were still trying to run the ball. How many guys does it take before they would pass it? If all 11 guys were there, would they pass to a wide open guy on the sidelines? I don't know. Um, you got to give what the defense, take what the ge- defense gives you. And you've got to look at what the defense is presenting and call plays designed around that in terms of at least identifying opportunities, if not picking on weaknesses. I don't see us doing that in any regard. It's almost like we're, we're calling our plays in a vacuum without ever thinking about or looking at the defense not just what maybe you're looking at what maybe they're looking at what they typically do but they're not looking at what they're actually presenting on the field and changing to something different yeah the elite of elite offenses go out there and they make they dictate to the defense what they're going to run right so like uh, this is what we're running because we're so good at it try stopping us make your defense adjust your defense to do what you need to do or what you think you need to do to stop us we are not at that level, Mm-mm. and I'm not too proud. Or you shouldn't be too proud as an offensive coordinator to do what you're saying and be like, "We're really wanting to run here, but they're just not letting us." Mm-hmm. So let's just let's take. You're going to give me the pass. I'll I'll take the pass. Yeah, I think I think after the the downs interception, that 
when we were trying to run the clock out to secure the game and they were using their timeouts, we went negative one yard to, Bar to Barnes, negative one Gabriel running, and then I think Barnes got five on the next one. So it was, what does that make it, fourth and seven or no, whatever? No, 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 no. It was, I think it was Barnes, Barnes, and then Gabriel on that weird cutback if he would have just kept running. He, uh, he, had, think, he had a hole in the left, and he, he had when I, when I don't I think looked he would have gotten it, there. Pretty, no, but we false started first. But well, we false started no, on the fourth down. On the, I was on the fourth down. Oh, I was on the fourth down. So that's what third. I was getting to. At that point, they had ten men in the box. It was literally Nick Anderson on our sideline with one defender. And I talked about in the postgame pod how much height and length he had yep. on his defender. And I think that play was going to be a throw to Nick Anderson yep. to try to get the seven yards yep. on the fourth and seven, which would have ended the game. And yeah, but what's Anderson jumped. Anderson seven. jumped off sides on I that, kind of agree. On that Why play. Why did you just go for it anyway? Yeah, we talked about it. if it, you know you sit on the punt, you'd rather kick it out of bounds of the ten than kick it in the end zone because yeah. of net you know giving it to him on the twenty. But I think that's why Anderson jumped off sides because he he was excited. getting the ball and was trying to get trying to get past his guy because yeah. it would have iced the game. Well, I think you're right. And but but why does it take you? I mean, I, I feel like we made after the weather delay, we made adjustments. We went down the field and scored, and then we got the turnover on the punt, or I mean on the kickoff, and we scored, and then we started running the ball better in the third quarter, and then it just seems like he never deviated away to to live the to give the possibility of a deep ball and that's when they just completely focused on bringing the safeties up yeah and why did it take you until the fourth and seventh play to finally decide you're going to throw against that easy of a coverage well in the upcoming game as i understand it the oklahoma state uh defensive backfield is very young very inexperienced it's another way of saying it and but very fast so they are also liable to be out of position um, at least that's what I've been told by people who have watched a lot more of them than I have. So that's an opportunity, but you've got to be willing to go after it and get it. Now, it gives me a little bit of hope because, as we've said before, Dylan Gabriel does not throw people open. He throws to people who are open. And that weakness can be okay if you get open a lot, if he can find those guys and just f deliver the ball to them. You won't get that many opportunities to do that, though, so those have to be perfect. You have to hit every one of them, I fear. I think that we're going to have to exploit that defensive backfield if we're going to have success, unless something magical is going to happen and we're going to develop a run game out of nowhere. Now, that said, we did develop a run game with Walker in most of the Kansas game. If we can find our footing in that respect and just be effective and also be effective in the passing game, we should be in really good shape. I mean, Oklahoma State's defense is 109th in total defense. They are 101st against the run and 90th against the pass. Okay, now look at Kansas and UCF. They're, right. they're in very similar positions, and we didn't move the ball well against either one of those teams. Yeah, it's it's definitely an opportunity. It's it's perhaps a key to victory, but it's yeah, we, not. There's nothing automatic about it. We obviously. said the same thing about you know Kansas had ran for 400 yards against UCF two weeks before we played them, That's and we true. we didn't run the ball very well against UCF, and then we said well Kansas gave up a bunch of yards to Texas, so we should have a bunch of yards against Kansas, and we didn't. I mean, but I we think did. we had 440 or whatever it was, but yeah, but we did move the ball against Texas when we. Absolutely had to. We stalled out in most of the second and most of the third and fourth quarter. Yeah, Kansas is a hundredth and UCF is a hundred and first. Yeah, so so it's just a little bit worse than those. Yeah, teams. we're looking at similar defensive uh, opponents, and well, that I, makes I don't the, feel like we that makes the last two weeks just even, even that worse. Much more yeah, worse. Yeah. Honestly, yeah, you should have scored forty in each game easily. Yeah, you should have been threatening. You should have, if you didn't score the way we didn't score, it should have been because of crazy things that blow up in your face like turnovers and just game ending or drive ending um, uh, penalties. mistakes, penalties. That didn't happen. Yeah, um, we, we scored 33 points and one of them on the, f on the fumbled kickoff, what did we start that drive on? The 18 or something around there? Right. I mean, that's a super short field. So we, we only scored 33 points and that was them giving us a gift right by the end zone. So that's not good enough for an OU offense. No, it's not. And that actually brings up something I've been concerned about, growing concern, and that is 
have we been under a bit of an illusion with our offense because of how good the defense has played, including the turnovers they've created and getting them into short field uh, yardage positions, especially early in games. And extra possessions. And extra yeah, possessions. Yeah, UCF, we started three drives in the first quarter and a half. Four. On their side of the yeah. field. And and came away with and seven came away points. With, yeah, one touchdown. So that worries me. It worries me a lot. Uh, um, it all circles back to something you said at the very beginning, Jay. Is Levy learning on the job? I think that the fan base, and that's why I brought up the poll, the fan base has turned. Um, those who were on the fence are now probably in the he's on the hot seat. I'm in the he's on the hot seat. To me, you, you're you looking at a situation where he's got to prove why he should retain his job, not you might lose your job. Almost like you're going to lose your job unless you convince me otherwise. And I put it at a, and I'll ask you guys what you think, what do you think the chances are he is the offensive coordinator at OU in August of 2024. Probability. 95 percent. I don't think. I don't think Brent's got the guts to make a move based on two okay years of offense. Outside of him getting a head coaching job somewhere, like a. Well, that would include him getting a, a job. What do you think the chances are? I don't know. That if it would, it depends on if he's willing to take <clears throat> a Mac job or a Sun Belt job or something like that. He's not going to get. To me, I don't think he gets a Power 5 job. Well, my number – you have a number, Jay? Uh, I think he will be our offensive coordinator. Probability only, be- is. only because I don't know that you want to go into the SEC installing something new, albeit even if it's something that's maybe not where you want it to be. I don't know if you start off in the SEC with something brand new. And number two, maybe this is even stronger than number one. And only Brent knows this and and this particular player and and his parents know this, but that's Jackson Arnold. He's not going to a mid-tier school. I think so, too. If if Lebby got a Power 5 job, then but not like in Illinois or Indiana or some crap school like that, it would have to be a perennial top 25 type team that for some reason their coach left to go take a, a higher profile job but USC Jackson Arnold's not he's not going to be at a mid-level school when he's got the talent he's got well what do you put the chances are what are the chances he's our coordinator yeah I'll, I'll usually say 95 percent I'll say it's 33 67 percent I think there's a 33 percent chance he's not going to be here and other people I've talked to, they put it the opposite. They think it's most likely he's gone. And I don't know if that's wishful thinking on their part or what, but they look at it as they thought with things that have happened, including the Art Bryles thing, if that had happened preseason, he'd already be gone. Now, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. We have a little bit of history based on Cal Gundy's experience to see what Brent's capable of doing in terms of letting somebody go. However, it is a different situation with Levy. He's the guy that he brought in. And like you say, you're going to the SEC. I well, just see two different paths the way he loses his job. One is we do very poorly, and that is he basically gets fired, and he may land in another job, but you are really just it's a graceful exit for being fired. The other is he gets found another job, and they help him find a way. So I think even in a situation where we win the national championship, he may not retain his job because they realize where they want to go and they help him find a different job. Now, if we win a title because our offense turns it around and is phenomenal, no, that's not going to happen. But if we win a if we win a title, even a conference title, looking good doing it, but only really because of our defense, I think there's a chance he gets found another job. Do you think Brent hired Lebby or do you think the athletic department, <clears throat> say Joe C or whoever, says here's a list of three guys that we think are really good offensive guys? And here's you. Here's their careers. Look at what they've done. We're going to bring those guys in for interviews, and then you make the final decision. But these are your three or four choices. To me, yeah, you made the hire, but he's not necessarily your guy. Do you think the latter like was a, the case? No, I don't. I I, I don't. Think I do. So. I don't know if it was like a, a forty and slip. Um, I believe it was Gabe and Teddy's podcast, but 
I'm pretty sure they had said that the reason that Levy is our offensive coordinator is kind of like how Bob picked Mike Leach. Leach. I think it was Venables, a tough offense to Venables defend. was like, this is the toughest offense I've had to go against. And it's very similar to what um, – So he picked him. Did Clemson play at Ole Miss? No, they, but they no. They didn't play UCF. No, but um, – Or the Syracuse, Baylor offense. No, Syracuse's offense is, uh, is also predicated off the same thing. And Syracuse is one of those teams that would come out of nowhere and knock off Clemson every other year. That's true. Mm-hmm. It would. So I, I, it seems like he kind of took the route of what do what is the hardest for – and it doesn't mean it's right, obviously, but, like, what do I have the hardest time defending? So Brent was really – had a really hard time defending jet sweeps is what you're telling me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I would be really shocked if, if Lebby was not Brent Venable's pick from the get-go, that he had mm-hmm. – he could go out and find any guy he wanted to find, and he went and found him. I don't think it would be a short list like a GM would do. Huh. But he may have been wrong about it. He may have been deceived about what he saw. Something that you've talked about a long time going now, Lucas, is did he really call the plays at all these places? So from what we see, it just leaves so much to be desired. But and don't you think he talks? He would have talked to Heibel and, and talked to Lane? Yeah, well, even Kel Gundy said after the fact that Jeff was one of the smartest guys he'd ever dealt with and all this other stuff. Right. But I haven't seen it. I haven't, I haven't seen, seen any creati- creativity. Well, it doesn't mean that there's a knack for calling plays. Yeah, yeah, and from what I've seen, he doesn't have it because he's coached 21 games now, and outside of the Tulsa's and the Arkansas States of the world, when we play anybody with just a decent defense, I don't feel like he's done anything special whatsoever. And this season, obviously, the defense has really helped a lot as far as um, field position and keeping our offense f- fresh. Um, I, I want it all along, and I've said this back in the day, I wanted Cal Gunny to get his shot because he was behind. I mean, he's on staff with Mike Leach, Mark Mangino, Kevin Wilson, Chuck Long, um, Josh Heupel, who I'm not a huge fan of, Lincoln uh, Riley. Lincoln Riley. I mean, he's seen all the best offenses literally the last two decades. He's seen some of the most prolific offenses in the history of college football, especially the Kevin Wilson years, especially the Lincoln Riley years. And what he called in the bowl game against Oregon was, which he did have Caleb Williams, but we were missing plenty of other great players that decided to sit the game out, offensive linemen, a couple skill position. And what I saw Kale call that game was awesome, I thought. I agree. And I always thought before that, Kale should have had his shot, and it really surprised me that Venables didn't give him that shot, and um, obviously he's gone, but if I was going to pick one guy to take over after Lebby, if Kale's not a if Kale's not a guy that would be allowed to come play or to come coach, I mean, Seth Luttrell could be your guy. Seth Luttrell has a history. He's been a head coach. He's He's been around for a long time. North Texas a really had of great offenses. A lot for a of while. those offenses as a player and then as a as a coach. So, is there? There, I'm going to answer my own question. There is a chance that everyone's been deceived by Levy. That not everyone. Well, everyone but you, because he was. And we talk about and criticize the rinky dink stuff and the gimmicky stuff, which you have to do when you're outmatched. Could it be that everyone saw that and thought, oh, wow, look at this guy. He finds a way to win, not realizing your expectations are so low that any time he has success, you're overweighting that and need to look at the full body of work to say, well, yeah, every once in a while he has something that seems brilliant, but it just happens to work. So I'm, I've been just as hard on Levy as, as most everybody else, and I try and temper that a little bit with, I'm willing to go one more season to see what Levy can do with, with a real Arnold. talented quarterback. I agree. And and it might not even take a season. It yeah. might only take three or four games heading into next year. Well, that's been our contention to be most like, of this season. Okay, this guy definitely is just not not the OC. Yeah. But there's a chance that next year, given given the arm strength, the quarterback given with all the, the ability, tools. Oh. All the tool, it might look incredible. It could. It could. And... In fact, I'll say it a different way. There's absolutely no excuse for him if Jackson if he can't get it to work with Jackson Arnold. I mean, with the talent we're going to have across the board, it's sufficient, if not excellent. 
you absolutely have to have success. Now, I don't mean you have to win every game and be, and be running people off the field with your offense, but it damn sure better be pretty potent and you, it better look good. Because yeah, I, I was, swear, I think I could call some pretty good calls with Jackson Arnold and look pretty brilliant. I was excited for the hire initially because I love the simplicity of the Bryles' offense. And, it, I mean, for college football, it really is a thing of beauty when you run it the way it's supposed to be ran. But we just haven't. And I don't know, I don't know if we're limited by DG. I don't know if we're limited by Levy not really knowing the ins and outs of a true Browse offense. Um, well, interestingly, for whatever reason, conservativeness, which I really, really believe they are too conservative. Which both, I don't think. I don't think the Baylor offense, the Browse offense, was not a conservative. offense. No, no, no. I mean, they're they're no, no but no, that's no. what's I mean, that's yes. what's irritating. Right, is exactly. They weren't. A, they were like, okay, uh, you've got nine in the box. Right. We're about to make you pay. Exactly. No, I'm not getting at that. And you that. drop into cover two, well, we're just going to pound it down your throat. You absolutely have to do that, and they're not and willing to do that. And we've been the exact that. opposite of I, and, and to that, I think it's more he doesn't see the field that's actually in front of him and the defense that he's actually presented with. What I'm getting at is he's, is he so conservative that, and I, we've said this deep into last season or way back into last season, before the Nebraska game, we were criticizing Dylan Gabriel for not having enough interceptions because he wasn't throwing the ball into coverage. Is that because his coach has been instilling in him this conservativeness, which also translates into he's not willing to take the risk with a true freshman, and he'd rather lose conventionally than win unconventionally, and that's why he's kept Dylan Gabriel in the mix the entire time. Or is it something about loyalty? Or is it something we don't know, and, and actually Dylan Gabriel's the better pick? I don't know, but I mean, it really worries me. You really don't see a whole lot in college football – of an established quarterback getting the boot for a younger player outside of we had Rattler and Williams. Oh, absolutely. I agree. We had um, Baylor did it. They won the Big 12 title with uh, the one kid. What's his name? Was it Buchanan or something? Bohannon or something like that? Yeah, he went to South Florida. They, yeah, they told him, you're not starting next year. We're going with the other guy, the younger kid. Um, I'm trying to think. I had another example. And their season's been trash. Yeah, they've been really bad this year. Yeah. I had another example of the – I can't remember who it was. Well, Clemson. Though. Clemson did it. Clemson's done it. Yep. They sent DJ on no, it's down very the road. Rare. Yeah. No, that's oh, what no, I was saying. That, they, um, Trevor Lawrence. When Trevor Lawrence took yeah, over. Trevor yeah, Trevor Lawrence. Yeah. No, I, I said the same thing this summer to guys who were telling me that, that Jackson Arnold was at some point going to start o- over Dylan Gabriel. I was speaking the other way, saying, no, it's not going to happen. It's not likely. But as the evidence came in, I changed my mind on what should happen. Yeah. And thought this was one of those rare cases where we should have given it a shot. And they, at the very least, they should have been playing Jackson Arnold enough to see if that could happen. Well, it's pretty criminal eight games into the season how little he's had a chance to be on the field. Yeah. That's another um, kind of under-the-radar negative on the season is we haven't put some of these teams away to get him on the field just to get reps. Yeah. I mean, you're in a tight game against SMU when you shouldn't be. Cincinnati, Cincinnati has proven to be not that good. UCF. I, Iowa time. State we actually looked good against, but still didn't get the opportunity. Um, can't I mean, UCF should have, should have been a game that you could have got Arnold in and played most of the fourth quarter because you had a 21-point yep. lead or something along those lines, and none of that's happened. And, it, and the defense has made their own mistakes on big plays here lately, but – Earlier in the season, the defense was the only one winning us these games, essentially. And you can only ask so much of them. I mean, right. with all the things they've done in terms of giving a play-up, I mean, it, we're really stretching to criticize this defense at this point as fans. This defense is over-delivering. They're still very young, and they're very new into the system, and they are doing extremely well. What, what is Jackson Arnold doing in practice is what I want to know. He's getting second team reps, so he probably doesn't have the the skill guys that Gabriel's got. But I guarantee you, he can see the middle of the field better than Gabriel because he doesn't see it very well at all. Other than when Drake Stoops is wide open, sitting in the sitting in his own defense. But he might in practice. But he might in practice. He might in practice. In fact, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if Dylan Gabriel in practice is remarkably better than what you see on the field because. 
that's the nature of when the game's really going live and a guy who goes into a shell. Uh, it, so let's, let's look at this game very specifically. The Bedlam game, the last one for some time, who knows how long. Um, Oklahoma State's losing their only rival. They've got a lot to play for. They're in pursuit still of a conference title appearance, and they, they've got to be very elated from where they were a few weeks back when they're losing to a pathetic South Alabama team and then getting beat by Iowa State as well. They, they have a lot to play for. We obviously have a lot to play for, so what are the keys to victory as you guys see it? What do we have to do, and what would it be nice to see us do to win this game? I mean, you obviously have to stop the run. Um, To some degree. We were talking earlier, what would you feel comfortable with Ollie Gordon getting? And that number's got to be under 150, hopefully closer to under 130, because the dude's gone for – he went 271 last week. He's gone – I think he's three games in a row of over 200 yards. He's two games in a row over – closer to 300 than 200. Well, he's two games in a row over 250, which is the only time that anyone has ever done that for Oklahoma State except Barry Sanders. So if you could keep him at 130, Bowman's not a running threat. I mean, he may pick up a a third down and seven on a scramble, but he's not a runner. Um, They've got another back that's decent, but, I mean, Ollie Gordon's a workhorse. So – if you've got <clears throat> Gentry Williams back and you can put him and Woody on an island with maybe one safety back, say Bowman, and then the rest of your guys like the McCullough, the Cheetah is able to stop the run. You've got, I mean, who's the other safety going to be? Key Lawrence? Got it, yeah, probably. If, if Bowen's healthy, I play I play Bowen. Um, I let, I I let like him. I like Bowen play. He, I, he can come up and. He's great on pass on like third pass passing down rushing and getting the quarterback. Um, we well, see a lot of Pearson's going to miss the first half, so he's not going to be a factor in the mm-hmm. first half of the game. And Key Lawrence, I mean, he's up, he's and, he's down. up and down. Yeah. He's he has some games where he's awesome. He'll get an interception. He's got games where he's running into the corner and leaving leaving the wide receiver open and mm-hmm. or drop interceptions i mean it's it's too hit and miss with him it's boom and bust but i feel like bowen and bowman at your safeties you can bring one of them up in the box if you have gentry either one to cover yeah. his island and 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 woody covering his what about McCullough? he's so good against the run yeah, I mentioned it. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. For the cheetah, he's a key. You know, they swap him and um, Dolby out, mm-hmm. but Dolby's more in passing downs in there, and yep. McCullough's more in the running downs. And if you do trust your corners to to man to man it, um, OSU will have some some three receiver sets. Or if you have one of your safeties take take that. Yeah. Well, slot then receiver. then you're looking at cover zero, cover zero if you got that, because then you're gonna have everybody up other than the three covering yeah. the receivers. Which Oklahoma State's offensive line has struggled. We should be able to get pressure. So I would say you, you're really highlighting defensively two keys to the game I would look for. One is defensive backs, a lot of the time on an island, if not always on an island, they've got to execute well. And then we've got to get pressure on the quarterback, but making him throw and beat you with his arm, which is all about we're going to be there to stop the run, and if it's not a run, we're here to give you pressure. So you don't have a lot of time, Bowman, at, to think about what you're going to do. You better execute perfectly. And if we're there to just just defend, you don't have to pick a pass off. Just make sure he can't complete it. They're in some, some second and third and longs that really put them in, in a difficult spot. If they're able to break off yardage and chunks with the run game, we could be in real and trouble. Gordon can catch the ball on running back screens. <clears throat> He's proven that. And Kansas hit us really hard on one last week on a third down. It was the perfect play call. They, mm-hmm. they had a running back screen. All of our guys got up the field, and the defensive line got turned loose, and we're, you know we're bearing down on Bean, and he just did this kind of sidearm throw for the running back screen that went for, I don't remember, it was 30 yards or something. And Gordon is a threat catching the ball in the backfield too. So you have to be leery of – Having Definitely that many so. guys in the box, no, you can't and get overly aggressive, and your single coverage on the receivers, and then everybody going up and then dumping it off to him because then there's nobody left to tackle. Got to play discipline. Yep. I think we were, uh, and it's no excuse whatsoever, but I I just feel like we were sleepy up in Kansas. I I don't know if we underestimated them. I don't know if we didn't feel like playing in a high school stadium. Flu. I don't know if we liked the weather. Uh, you know, the flu, the, the cold, the delay. I don't know what it was. But 
the defensive line that showed up in Kansas will get absolutely abused yep. if they play that way again. And they really haven't played that way all year. Mm-mm. That's got to be the worst they have played. And it's not some phenomenal Kansas offensive line. Um, if the D line that shows up that showed up against if every if other they can team, eighty five percent of the effort they gave against Texas mm-hmm. in this game, Oklahoma State's going to have a long day because mm-hmm. we were living in Texas's backfield with a much more heralded offensive line than anything that Oklahoma State has. So offensively for OU, what are the keys to victory? Throw the ball down the field. Just do what, do what works. Less jet sweeps. Yep. Or if you're going to jet sweep it, you fake. You know how they do the Drake where he comes behind uh-huh. Gabriel? You fake that pass, and then you look to throw it somewhere else. Maybe even, I mean, give Stogner a tight end screen and have him, have him lined up on the line of scrimmage next to the tackle. Mm-hmm. You fake the throw to, to Drake out of the backfield on the sweep, on the fake jet sweep. And Stogner kind of flares out with the linebackers are going to be looking for the jet sweep and maybe overcommit. Mm -hmm. And then Stogner's out there by himself with two receivers blocking. Something like that, a misdirection. It doesn't doesn't seem like our jet sweeps are hardly any misdirection because we're almost always push-passing it or handing it off. That's what I was going to say. I I haven't gone back to really break it down on why our jet sweeps don't work because I feel like they're the least successful jet (laughs) sweeps of any team I've watched (laughs) run a jet sweep. And... It just, I don't know if it's not schemed well, it's not blocked up well, or it's just, it's so not surprising. Yeah. It's, it's just what's telegraphed. Funny is it's, it's not blocked up well, and yet we always move extra blockers in front of it, which I think is part of the problem. We're always putting too many guys out there advertising what we're about mm-hmm. to do. So one of my keys to victory would be, don't be predictable. We've been so predictable, and we're here we are. Eight games into the season, and we have yet to see a wrinkle out of the things that we were seeing them do early in the season that did and didn't work. What I was hoping when I'd see us do the same play for the third or fourth or fifth time, I was hoping that, oh, but if you just pull that ball up and do something different, hit a receiver, whatever it happens to be, a pump misdirection, fake. a pump fake, anything, you get them to bite because all they've seen on film is exactly what you just did. Yep. Well, I mean, it seems like... At this point, a reverse on that jet sweep could be lethal. <laughs> I can go Who would the, see it coming? Yard. I mean, no one would. I mean, we follow. have run reverses that have been stopped, also mid-season. A jet sweep reverse? Yeah, I, th- I think we've run that at least twice, and I don't remember. Them. I remember the reverses. I don't remember if they were jet sweep reverses. Maybe so on that. Well, well on that because the pers- pass. the pursuit when we run a sweep, when we, a jet sweep, the pursuit by the defense is just phenomenal. Oh, it's, it's well, like Steve it's said, like they got our play call. Your motion is Stogner over there to the to the same side you're doing the jet sweep. Well, that brings another defender. Like it'll bring a linebacker and maybe even a safety. So now you've got one extra guy on that side that you're sending the jet sweep to, but you've got one and a half or two guys focused in on that being the next play, and you never fake out of that. But that's what's to so throw the other direction. It is, you know, we don't we're not paid two million dollars. I know to figure that out. We don't so, have an all twenty-two. We don't have a clicker going back and forth saying, "Right, the, you Identify. know, look, look at these defenders be, and what they did the last six games against this same now play." In defense, it's only like one and a half million, oh. right? <laughs> <laughs> and even for someone like Gabriel, you almost check out of it mid snap, right? right? You like you see Figure it, you see the defense out. adjust, and you're like. Yeah. No. I'm not giving him this ball. Right, it's I'm not just going to let work. him run right past me. I'm going to keep it. Yeah, and get three, four yards. Yeah. But his, he has proven, Dylan Gabriel's proven again and again, he does not think on his feet and second-guess the play call. He does not pull it down and run when he should. He does not um, look off and check off the, in, in the right fashion. If it's outside of the absolute formula of what they've designed, he does not seem to be willing and able to do it. So I think one of the things that I've been very disappointed in, which is sort of ironic, as gimmicky and as tricky as Jeff Levy tries to be, all his stuff is so predictable. And I don't see the tricky stuff that I'd like. Like, Normally when you're criticizing someone for being too tricky, they're doing all kinds of goofy trickeration stuff throwbacks to the quarterback and what is the, you know, trying to sneak a guy around and behind, doing a double pass. It's never anything like that. It's just 
we're going to run a guy in motion and we're going to have him zigzag here and that's going to be the extent of it. We're going to hand the ball off to Stogner or something. I know he hasn't done that, but something to the equivalent of that where it's like, well, that's tricky just because no one saw it coming, but why the hell would you do it? Well, yeah, I want to know, know what UCF was thinking when we come out there and Stogner's in the backfield. <laughs> They're probably like, yes, <laughs> I like this wrinkle. Yeah. <laughs> Let's maybe more come of this, out and please. do more of this. Should we actually let them succeed here so they do it the yeah. rest of the game? I mean, that's what people are going to be thinking with Farouk back there running back now. If they, yes, if there's they try a great that again, example. Or, or even Drake back there. Yep. It, it's, it's like, oh, this, this was going to be a stupid play. We're going to stop it. So, that, yeah, that's a great example. So it, you put Farouk back there and you run up the middle. That's not what you're looking for there. You're looking for a guy who's got speed on the edge and that can really exploit someone who leaves him open in a wheel route or something. And not even that. Even further than that, if you're going to run Farouk, up the middle of the line. <laughs> Do it in a direct snap to give yourself an additional. Don't blocker. waste the yeah. handoff. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Don't. Yeah, don't even bother. And don't with and don't put your quarterback at wide receiver because yeah. everybody in the world knows that they're just going to stand there. <laughs> exactly. How many times have we seen him do that? We saw him do it early in this season with, with Gabriel when Jackson Arnold was under center. We saw him do it with Braden Willis against Texas where they put Bevel out there. Oh, I know. Just standing there. at the painful three feet from the sideline. And, and they again snap and the ball, and he just looks at the corner like, I'm not doing anything. What are Which you Which I do? don't understand. It's like it, That's what I keep waiting for is the throw over to the sidelines. We did see that one time that Arnold pretended to be leaving the field and didn't and li- lined up his wide receiver, and then they didn't run it. And they decided to go away from it. Was that their conservatism got coming out? Like, if it isn't the most wide open trick play in the world, are they just not going to run it? Sometimes you've just got to execute really well. That's somebody I would trust it going out to catch a pass. Though. Absolutely. <laughs> or, to, or to catch a pass for Ga- a second pass. I don't trust Gabriel to go out and <laughs> no. on a route. But, but if you, if I think Jackson Arnold backwards, athletically could do it. And a pass, you know, a backwards pass to him, and then he hits a guy streaking the other direction, and he can throw 60 yards in stride, that could be lethal. But you actually have to be willing to do it, and you have to have Dylan Gabriel get him the ball in time, not something that takes so long to get over to the sidelines that he's going to get tackled for a loss. So, I don't know. We, we, it's funny. We, we start down road to victory or, or keys to victory, and we get, we <laughs> get on comes back to the frustration. But it is the frustration. I think I, the key to victory is not doing this crap we're talking about. I say all this, and I'm strangely confident for this game. I don't know. I don't know if it's... You're mentally unstable. History no. is on your side. No, I, I like the idea that um, we should be pissed. Yeah. And I think <clears throat> as poorly as we played, it is a good football team we went up against, and we did put up 30-something points and as won bad the as the offense was. And we did identify it. It's not like we had a early on and mid touchdown and a punt return for a touchdown. Well, they, they hand us the ball on the 15 or 18-yard line on that Well, we handed kickoff, it to them too. on the 15 or 18 and right, but we're just talking about offensive scoring points. True, no, I know. But That's I'm, a freebie. But, but what you're saying is, we identified early in the season and mid-season this would be one of our toughest opponents. Sure enough, it was. Sure enough, we lost. And we played, but we horrible. played, and we played horrible. And yet we we're still in the game right to the end. I would agree that Oklahoma State is catching Oklahoma at a really bad time for them in terms of we're coming off of a loss that we're going to be fired up, mad about, for what it's worth. Now we got to do something about it. You got to prepare right, and you got to. Compl- call good calls it doesn't matter how mad you are it matters how well you play i mean i think that's one of you know saban's greatest things that he's done is you know convince and then kirby the last two years <laughs> yeah. for sure everybody doubt us yeah, yeah it's yeah. just to convince his players week in and week out that you know you're you're being disrespected no one thinks you're good enough yeah da, da, da. and for some you're reason just ranked number one all season long but everybody doubted you yeah, yeah but for some reason <laughs> oh you and there's there's i mean even ohio state's <laughs> fallen to this sometimes and uh, clemson everybody sometimes it just takes these kids to legitimately get punched in the face and to feel the pain of a loss and be like, crap, every, I, you, we're just kind of coasting along. I, I, on it, I was talking to Lucas on the way over here. I actually feel better going into this game having lost to Kansas than if we had held on to have a one-point win. I feel like oh, I would we agree would just with that. keep coming into this game each week. That thinking, well, we, can we might it. not play that good, but we're still going to win this game. We don't see the problem. So, so yeah, there's not 
there's not an issue, right? We don't have well, big issues. Yeah, but we heard this. We heard the exact opposite <laughs> from from Stutzman and other guys on the team that said, you know, Brent said after the game, you always want to win these games, but I got a ton of film on that's going to show how bad we played against UCF, and we're going to get that stuff corrected to go to Kansas because, you know, our guys might have gotten too, you know, high and mighty after the Texas win. But I'm still going to ream them over a bunch of stuff well, yeah, I saw today. Yeah, but what he's saying is it, it, it's not enough. You actually got to lose. Yeah, so I mean, it's just like, I don't know, parenting, right? I mean, you tell your kid till you're blue in the face, you know, some poor don't decision. You're going to hurt yourself. Like, you're going to hurt they, themselves. And then they make it. Then they make the, the, they do the dumb thing. And it's like, oh, I see what dad was talking My about. My only criticism of that is the kid isn't the kids, isn't the players it isn't they need to play harder want it all that even though they had room for improvement it was the coaching the kid is jeff levy did jeff levy learn enough to actually change his ways maybe maybe that's what it took maybe it took that loss to to wake him up from where he wherever what slumber he's in or to get the rest of the coaching staff to say you know one guy in particular to come down and say hey this has to change this the, has to change These now. other schools you're mentioning, though, the Ohio States, the Michigans, the Georgias, and Alabamas, they can they can suffer a loss and still make the playoff because the rest of their conference schedule is tougher. We weren't in the we were aren't in the condition of our conference more than likely that if we ran the table, that one loss will probably derail our playoff chances outside of some really crazy college stuff happening. I don't think crazy stuff has to happen. Just a few losses. We've said this on the pod several times. It makes no sense to us that these kids can't fully get up for every single game of only a 12-game schedule because we would give anything to to run out on that football field. But for some reason, it just seems to be that way. That's why it's so hard to go undefeated. I don't think it's about them getting up. I think this is a... I think but that was a part of it. You can include coaches in that. I, I yeah. mean, I think okay. coaches yeah. can do the same thing. I, I agree. I don't. I think that's the source. Like, like the Twitter poll. I think, I'm. I I answered the poll. It's mostly play calling and a little bit quarterback play. So yeah, that's why I did too. And and I would also say if we would extend it to um, player play across the board, yeah, there's a lot of criticism to go around. In fact, maybe Walker was the only person you don't criticize. But you mentioned the defensive line. They deserve criticism. There was a lot of lack of execution and and poor play, sleepy play, whatever you, you want to say, across the board for sure. And maybe this does wake them up from that. But it's going to take good play calling to actually get to victory. Let's see what we get with a 2.30 kickoff time too. I mean, maybe that's a factor. Maybe we play better at 2.30 instead of 11. Who knows? Maybe so. I think the better conditions probably help a little bit. Uh, it's tough to go on the road and play in a dreary environment when you're down. Now, when you're up, you can put a team away. But there, we have a disparity against Oklahoma State in terms of talent. We are better than them. And the conditions are going to allow our talent, if we take advantage of it, to exploit that situation. You don't have bad conditions that are bringing two teams closer together just by the nature of what bad weather can do sometimes. So that's that's something maybe to be hopeful for. We'll see. It's it's one less excuse that they're going to get. They're not going to get many excuses. And if they lose this game, ooh, it's going to be ugly. Um, I would even say it might be just a lock that Lebby loses his job. Speaking of locks, that brings us to the locks of the week. The realest deal, locks of the week. And the Locks of the Week are brought to you by Five Star Concrete Locks of the Week. David and Josh are a local business serving the metro area from patios, sidewalks, driveways, shops, and more. Call them or text them at 405-306-3014 or look them up on Facebook at Five Star Concrete. So they're bringing, they're the sponsor now of the Locks of the Week, and we better deliver for them the way they deliver for customers. And that puts a lot of pressure on some of us, um, maybe me, because I didn't do so well last week. I was one and two. Uh, Lucas, you were one and two. Connor was two and one. Jay, you turned it around. I finally, I got, you know, I don't know what to say. Just felt good last <laughs> How week. How about say three it and oh? Because you were three, three and oh. Well, for the season, I am pulling up the rear 42%. Jay is. 
getting close to break even at 47 percent pathetic lucas 57 percent nice. connor 60 percent wow for a group we're at 51 percent and i have you know obviously the one to apologize for that i i think we're going to turn it around though this week because i tell you what i've got some stellar locks of the week you're going to want to go to the bank and get a little more money because you want to put it all on on these three i'll start us off i've got michigan giving up 32 and a half to purdue I think that the the Boilermakers are not good at football, and they're especially not good when you when a team comes to town who knows all your play calls. So that's and they're gonna, trying to prove a point. They're, and they're trying. They need to prove a point. Yeah. Um, Florida State giving twenty one and a half to Pittsburgh, and Oregon State giving thirteen and a half to Colorado. What I do like you guys got? One. Oh well, let me let me give you Connors before you guys get to yours. Our leader, Connor, he's Who? got Connor. Connor. Oh, he's in, he's not here today. Yeah, yeah, he's he's off. He's, okay. he's he's on a mission. He's he's doing some good work for for the pod. Um, he's got Notre Dame giving three and a half to Clemson. He's got UCF giving four and a half to Cincy, and he's got SMU giving eleven and a half to Rice. So both of us have three favorites picked. What do you got, Lucas? I also have SMU minus eleven and a half to Rice. Uh, Rice burned me a couple weeks ago. I went against them last, I think last week, and covered, or maybe it was the week before. So I got that one. I've got um, Ole Miss minus two and a half against A&M. Uh, I think Ole Miss is rolling. It's tough to play there, um, and I don't think a is very good. They're not. And then I'm going to ride my horse of uh, JMU, the Dukes, minus five and a half. I think they're playing Georgia State, if I remember correctly. All right. Well, well, after going 3-0 and last week, yeah. I, I looked at the games and, gosh, nothing really jumped out at me that I was too excited about. I'm going to take Utah on a uh, bounce-back game from being embarrassed by Oregon. That just doesn't happen to Utah, especially at home. So they're minus 10.5 versus Arizona State. I also am taking Notre Dame minus 3.5 at Clemson. And I'm going to take Tulsa minus three and a half versus the Charlotte 49ers. The 49ers, that's a pro team. Yep, okay. Tulsa's really up their game. Wow, that's <laughs> impressive. Well, Brock Purdy's out, so Way to go, maybe Tulsa. they got a chance. That's true, that's true. He's they did just get uh, <laughs> Chase, Chase Young. Was it, was it? Yeah, Chase yeah. Young. Well, we'll see what we can do with those, but definitely a thank you to Five Star Concrete, our new sponsor. Yeah, thank you. Well, that brings us to some score predictions for Bedlam. Um, OU is, are they still a six point? At five and a half. Five and a half. Open, it, open at six and a half. And now it's dropped five, to and, five and, a half. and a half. Oh. I mm. think I said on the post game. Can I uh, change my locks? I, I, I think I said in our text group that uh, I think that line's going to get maybe even down to four by kickoff. But it's only dropped a point since it came out, so maybe it won't. But. So you think it would be smart money driving it to four or the public money? I don't know. Last week the Kansas opened at nine and a half, then dropped eight and a half, and then seven and a half when we were driving the stadium, and it was seven well, two minutes smart, before kickoff. That's smart money that late, right? So that was that's one of the more shocking lines I've seen drop that many points. It was a big move over that amount of time. So this one, it's it's dropped a point so far. Maybe people are just, you know, oh, you got beat. OSU's on the upswing right now. They've won four in a row. They're looking good, and they're just. Counting on that. Well, Maybe they could be why. digesting injuries, which that and, and flu. I'm not making an excuse, but that could have been contributing factors to the money coming in last week. I don't know. I don't know. It looks smart, though. That's for sure. Well, let's go in reverse order. Jay, what is, what's your score for Bedlam? I'm going to go 42-27. Oh, you. All right. Lucas? I have Oklahoma 31 Oklahoma State, 34. That's just uh, sick and sad. You're going against... I'd love to be wrong. Logic. Well, you're yeah. going to be wrong. You're going to be wrong. I hope so. The markets would say you're wrong. You're, you're off by about nine points. <laughs> um, Connor has 42 <sighs> to 31. So a little bit tighter ball game than what you've got, Jay, but very similar score. I've got the Sooners, 35... The Cowboys, 24. 
So I've got them. I've got us holding them to the lowest score, but I've got us about mid range in our group. See, that's interesting. I'm usually, I've been on the lower end of the OU scores uh, offensively. Like what yeah, you have. I like all three of y'all's groups. Scores. I, I, I don't know. I've, it's I've been strangely, just not nervous this whole week. I don't think Oklahoma State's very good. History would they, prove you right. I think they, kind of, I mean. This kid came out of nowhere. He's transformed their football team, but it's just one guy. It's just one running back. It's not some incredible quarterback that came off the bench. Their O line is still trash. Their defense is trash. Oklahoma State. Their O line's not trash when the dude's rushing for 250 it is. plus. No, he is he's rushing. Br- I know he's breaking tackles. He's breaking tackles in the backfield all over the place. <sighs> I don't, man. They're not just making these gaping holes that anyone can run through, and he just happens to be the starting running back. And to keep that in mind, they haven't played anyone that's as good as us at wrap-up tackling and gang tackling. Well, we've been really bad at tackling the last two, uh, three games. We've had missed tackles. Yeah, I mean, yes. we definitely have to shore it up. But, no, I don't know. There's just – this kid's just come out of nowhere too fast. He's a good player, but he's, he's all I he got. Well, history would be on your same. side. OU has beaten Oklahoma State 91 times, and these stats and more will come out Saturday morning um, from our Twitter account. That is as much or more than any team has beaten any other team in the history of college football, uh, top division football. Uh, The only other team to beat another team that many times is Nebraska over Kansas. We're 91-19-7 all all time, 81% against the Cowboys. Since 1950, we're 84%. And we're even better in the Gundy era. Uh, I didn't have that stat specifically here, but we've won a higher percentage when Gundy's the coach. Everyone who's an Oklahoma State fan criticizes Gundy when he plays the Sooners that he's too conservative. Anytime they've had something to play for, aside from maybe 2011, they've found a way to lose. Um, I think he's 3-16, and 16, if I remember right. Because I think the stat was 3-19 like between so playing he, career and So he coaching. started in 2004 or 2003. Um, I can't remember when. No, because let's see. No, 2004, Saban, 2003. Yeah. 2003 is letter rip. 2004 was his first. So yeah. he's so it's He took one, over for Saban two, at LSU. 4, after 5, we lost 6, him. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. He is 3-16 and 16 against the Sooners. That's what I thought. So, very poor. Let's do the math on that. Just to 0-3 as a player also. That's true. Now, that's he was on staff with um, Les Miles. So, for we've won two, 84%. Two we are eighty over 84% of the games against Mike Gundy. That's higher than what we've done since even 1950 and definitely higher all time, which is so telling the best coach in their history has had a worse record against the Sooners. Now, he could correct some of that with a victory on Saturday. All that said, I don't put a whole lot of stock in it other than he may have what gets to be a little bit of emotional distress in this game that we won't necessarily have, that Venables won't necessarily yeah. have. He he may get too tight in He's the He's gone very conservative in years past. Um, and I it remember may be one, worse here. one before halftime, fans were booing him for down in the ball out. I think they had it on their own 40 mm-hmm. with like – 35 seconds left and they had timeouts and they just kneeled it essentially yeah he's done um, quite he's, a few things that were inexplicable in terms of being and scary even one of those did. wins was our fault with the kicking the tyreek hill twice right right that could be another loss and you know one more loss and one less win for them as gundy as a coach i think 2014 so his record could be even worse if we didn't kick the tyreek hill twice that game yeah so and and, and of course we've stolen a couple if you yeah. will but all that said, it does seem that, that Gundy has had a problem trying to beat the Sooners, which are definitely his nemesis, whereas we're not, they're not our nemesis. Yeah, he's had so way better against Texas than Emotionally, this could we, weigh in on him if, if we get into a close game or if there's something down the street. What do you got, 31 points for us? Yes. Are we got 34? 35. 35? I mean, I think that's... Have you seen our offense? That would not be good. No, it would be in this game. It I mean, it really that, would it, not w- be good. it really troubled me to pick that low. I started with 42 actually, and talked my way out of it, thinking, "What have you seen recently that convinces you that we're going to do it?" And so I'd rather be wrong if 
if that plays a factor by under predicting a little bit, but I think I'm basing it on recent reality. The pro see, what's hard for me is I know it's there. Agreed. Like, I mean, they're going to they're going to try to shorten the game. Kansas very good shorten the game with their running game, and if all OSU really has is a running game, and they can get more first downs than I don't remember how many Kansas had, but I think it was twenty, if I remember right. If they can keep getting three to four yards a carry, they're going to have a lot of first downs, and the clock doesn't stop with first downs anymore. So they're going to be able to shorten this game with their rushing game if they have their way decently against us, if which, which gives us le less opportunities to score with less drives. We had 74 plays last week. What if this week we have 65 plays? I don't trust our offense enough that they're going to score – six touchdowns which is what which would what 42, 42 would, be. would be so well maybe the defense scores one maybe the defense touchdowns. does score so another thing to think about is i would rather us play very aggressively put receivers on islands and or right, cornerbacks on islands and allow them to score quickly if they score if they execute just to, perfectly versus they move the ball down the field in a monotonous way eating up a lot of clock and still get the touchdown. So I hope they play a little extra aggressive against the run and at the line of scrimmage, putting pressure on Bowman, such that it's it's sort of um, going for bust, in a sense. That if you score right away, fine, but you're going to have to execute perfectly. If you don't, which is very much out of the 2000, circa 2011 Oklahoma State playbook, if you if you don't, they're going to feast, if, if feast or famine. And there could be a lot of turnovers that, that are very uh, could change the game in OU's favor uh, if OU's aggressiveness pays off. Here's our scoring production for the season. I'm going to go game after game. 73 against Arkansas State. Throw that one out. That's a, you know, nobody. No, that one counts. They all count. They're not exhibition. SMU, we scored 28. Tol SMU is a pretty good team. Tulsa, we scored 66. SMU is a good team. That's, that's another throwout game. 20, <laughs> 20 against Cincinnati. Okay, so now we're at a conference. 20 against Cincinnati. That's, that was way too low. 50 against Iowa State was fantastic. Yeah. And we all praise Levy for a good. Yep, that's right. But I think we still had a defense. Do we have a pick six in that game? Iowa State. Uh, Bowman? Was it, that the one Bowman? It seems took like back? we had a pick six to get 50. Texas, 34. They're a good defense. They're a good team. It's a big time game. 31 against UCF. Not good. 33 against Kansas. So yeah. I'm seeing. A trend here of not scoring more than 35 points on a regular. I mean, outside of the Iowa State game, it's the only anomaly. I I don't know how you can pick a score in the 40s when we're playing offensive football like this. Well, two of two of the four of us did. Yeah, they got some explaining to do. <laughs> I think you're. I I think the pick is right in terms of our capabilities. It's wrong in terms of what we've actually been showing. But we'll see. We'll see what it is. What's the total on this game? Uh, 60 and a half. So that's pretty low scoring for a Bedlam game. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's 30s for both teams, like high 30s and low 20s for a team. Or it's maybe 40 to 20-ish. I mean, that's... 60 and a half. And that's, I have, that's a pretty low Well, I have it at 59, total. so... Yep. I, I backed into that. I've actually. got it at 65. Yeah, Keeping so both teams I in the low 30s. I was aware of the over-under, but it made sense to me, at least when I picked my score. We'll see. Um, we won't be there. They're charging outlandish prices in that small rinky-dink stadium that seats about, I mean, the 50, in terms 55. of the high school stadiums in this state, is it like the third biggest? How big is it? I mean, it's, it's, not, it's up there, but it's not that big. Speaking of high school um, games, me and Jay are going to go do some um, recruit watching on Friday. Yeah. Nice. We're going to go to Carl Albert. All right. And watch Kevin Sperry. Uh, who's the running back? Uh, I say Kevin Sperry's committed to OU. I want to say it's Alexander, but I don't I think I believe right. the running back's committed, right? Yep. And they have a receiver that, that I think we're in his top, or his final five or something, whatever the recruits do nowadays, right. five or eight or whatever. I think he announces soon, so actually. Well, take notes. We're going to go see Friday night Carl yeah. Albert versus Piedmont, and I'm expecting a route by Carl Albert, and Kevin Sperry has looked like a five-star kid. I think he's a four-star currently, but he's a 2025 kid. 
So he's got another, he's a junior. He moved up here from Texas because he wanted to be close to OU. That's how big of a, that's how big of a committee he is. He literally moved to Oklahoma City, Midwest City, whatever we're calling it. Yeah, that's huge. Carl Albert, to, just because he wanted to be close to the program. So um, we're going to go check that out and see how that goes. Well, that's great. Take some notes and, and bring a report back. I want, I want to hear what you guys saw live in person on that. Maybe we'll get a chance to talk about it when we're discussing the big victory against Oklahoma State on Saturday in that post-game pod. Anything else to talk about in this game coming up? Nope. Well, we'll have Connor back on the show for the post-game pod. All of us will be here to watch it and break it down and then and give you our take. We'll Hopefully, get, we'll get that pod out quick. We're going to get that pod out quick. We always get those pods out quick. Um, if you want the, the real analysis nice and quick, tune in, subscribe, tell your friends about it. Xavier Robinson is the kid. Right, the that's right. Team. I knew that. Follow us on all the social medias. Follow Facebook, us on all of it. X, YouTube, all of it. And special thanks, of course, to our sponsors, Five Star Concrete, and our sponsor for the Midweek Pods, Fluke Luke Fishing. Go check him out on YouTube. Um, well, guys, I'm excited. Last Bedlam, we're going to win. Boomer? Sooner. Sooner.